Hello and welcome to this lecture. We'll be talking about how to do LDA analysis on EEG data using MATLAB code. So let me describe a quick classification problem to you. Let's imagine we've been recording some EEG data while participants are viewing particular objects and we want to see whether we the code type of object they're looking at. Now we know the categories the images fall into, they're either animals or they're objects. We don't exactly know what pattern to look for right now. So what can we do about it? Well, we can look at a single channel such as PZ in a sort of a univariate e ERP based analysis. But if we color code our data points so that the yellow dots are animals, the blue dots are objects, well, it doesn't seem like a super clear division. Uh, no matter where we draw the hyperplane, but the accuracy is not going to be great. So you know, it seems that just looking at this electrode PZ, it's just not very helpful. And if we took another electrode, if we took uh, O1, for example, again, such a divide doesn't really help. I mean, it's a little better in the case of O1, but still, it's, well, we could do better. But if we took a multivariate solution, if we looked at both channels together, and then draw a hyperplane, this dotted line we've got going on here. Well, then we get a perfect separation between the animals and the objects. And this is exactly what we want to do. But how do we find such a boundary? How do we find the best way to separate out, separate out these two categories? Well, this is exactly what I'm going to be going on and further into in this video. So the goal of LDA, we can say, is to try and maximally separate two categories. So given EEG data, we want to find a way to really tear those two categories apart. And it's best to consider, well, what do I mean by maximally separate? Well, in short, when we talk about maximally separating these two categories, we want to make sure the means of the two categories are really far apart. So we know the average of animals and the average of objects are as far apart as possible. And we also just want to make sure that the variation within groups is as small as possible. Because if we've got a low variance and a high mean difference, then we can be really reliably separated in these two categories. And again, if we're minimizing the variance in these two categories, then we know the results aren't going to be skewed off by a single trial, which is really affecting the mean, which we're separating categories based on. So, well, the idea of a large difference in means and a small variance might sound familiar to some in the audience. And that's because it really shares a lot with uh, the concept of a t-statistic or what you might do in a dependence on the t-test. So in the um, formula, this simplified t-formula we've got here, we can see that the t-statistic, which is telling the difference between two groups, involves approximating the difference in the mean of these two groups, so that's the numerator, x1 minus x2, divided by the variance of the um, data. So if you were to increase this mean difference, the t value goes up. And similarly, if you were to decrease the variance, the t value also goes up, because the denominator, when you divide by the denominator, a smaller number means a greater outcome. So Maybe that also helps you get a conceptual idea of what's going on with the linear discriminant analysis. It's really trying to make sure that we can maximize the difference between the means of the two groups while making sure the variance is as small as possible and essentially end up with a t-statistic, which can, we can later use to try and tease apart categories in a test data set on the general population. Right, so how do we go about doing this? Luckily, there's a lot of toolboxes out there which can run the classifier without you ever needing to worry about the code or worry about how it works. For example, there's MVPA Lite and Cosmo MVPA, which are both great toolboxes which work with MATLAB to help you uh, compute your classifier. But there's also the issue that if you really rely on toolboxes, it's often where the errors occur. Because it's all being done underneath in some functions, you never really know what's going on. And if there's potential compound, you're never quite sure what it is. So basically what I'm going to talk through now is how to do it by hand. How to use simple MATLAB code 
to tear apart these two categories to conduct LDA. And we do this by first calculating the means, which we can then use to separate out the two categories. We then look at the covariance in the data to find how to minimize uh, the variance within categories. And then we use the mean and the covariance together to try and find the best way to weight these channels in order to maximally separate the two categories. We can then take these weights and apply them to the test data with the hope that they generalize and we can use this classifier to help pull apart uh, independent data. Now, how I'm gonna do this is I'm just gonna go through a few slides where I've cut and paste some MATLAB code. And all of this code has been taken from the MVPA light toolbox, the functions train LDA and test LDA. And as I walk through it, hopefully you get an idea of what that function is doing so that in the future, if you're ever using this toolbox or if you're using something similar like Cosmic and VPA, then you know how it's working, you know what it's doing, and you're not just relying on some function to do the job for you. So we're going to be starting off quite easy. We're going to get the, the mean of the classes. And all we need to do to calculate the means of each class or each category, however you prefer to call them, um, is essentially, um, yeah, get the means nothing more to it. Um, but just to give you a quick primer of what some of these variables are, we've got X. So this is our data. We, it's going to be a matrix where on the first dimension, we've got the trials. And on the second dimension, we've got the channels. So um, no, we're not considering multiple time points right now. We're just focusing on a single time point across all channels, which we're going to use as features and trials as we, that we're going to use as exemplars. And that's X. C label, this variable called C label, label will be the category labels. And this is simply a, uh, a vector of numbers where one is category one, we call that the animals, and two is category two, um, which we'll call the objects. So we first start off by just getting the logical indices of these two categories. So IX1 tells us which stimuli are part of category one, IX2 tells us which stimuli are part of category two. And then we take X, we select the channels relevant to that condition, and then we compute the mean. And we get mu one, and we get mu two, which tells us the mean of the two categories. Um, and this will be a vector of 50, or however many channels you've got. In this case, we've got 50 channels. So you have a different mean for each channel, for each group. Okay, so that was quite simple. I'm sure everyone's quite familiar with how to do the mean, but now we're gonna kick it up a notch. Um, so we wanna find a way to minimize within class variance. So that's the within category um, variance to make sure that when we're separating conditions out, there's, it can't be biased by outlying variables. Okay, um, to do this, we need to see how the data varies between channels. And this is where we compute the covariance which you can do with this function called COV, which stands for covariance. Um, and what we want to do today, we want to get this common covariance matrix, which is the shared variance between the two categories. So we look at covariance for data set one, or for class one, and covariance for class two, and we sum them together to get a common covariance, which we call it SW. So for those of you who are not familiar with a covariance matrix, what we've got here is a 50 by 50 uh, matrix. This we could put 50 channels in the data, which essentially tells you how much each pair of channels varies uh, with one another. So a big score, um, which would be in yellow, means there's a very high similarity in the data in the channel here. So we can look at channel five here relative to maybe channel 10. Um, on the x-axis and we can say, oh, well, there's quite a bit of similarity there. And then a dark value means there's quite a lot of opposing similarities, almost like a negative correlation between the different channels. And this massive matrix will tell us how each individual channel co-varies with every other channel. Now you can see this little yellow dot going down the middle, and this is the diagonal, that's what we call, call it, the diagonal. Um, and this has always got quite a strong yellow dot going on here. 
And this is because it's pretty much, you look at the covariance within a channel, which is always going to be exceptionally high. So you get a very nice diagonal, and that is a nice little way to know that the data, the covariance matrix you've computed makes sense. Okay, so we've got a covariance matrix for class one, we've got a covariance matrix for class two, and we've just done these bits of code to compute those two bits. But now we want to make sure we want to estimate the common uh, covariance, so the variance which is shared within the two classes. And to do this, we can add the two covariance matrices, matrices together, like so, and we get the common covariance. So it should be noted that if your trial numbers are unbalanced, then it's important to weight the data. And this is where the variables M1 and M2 come into play. So if you see here, we've got M1, M2. So if we multiply the covariance matrix by the number of trials, that's in the condition one. So M1 is the number of trials in condition one. And we multiply the covariance for class two by M2, which is the number of trials for class two. And we can essentially just weight the covariance both covariance matrices by the number of trials within that condition. And then we can weight the common covariance matrix when we sum them together. So voila, we now have a covariance matrix, which tells us how the activity of each channel covariates with every other one. And then we can also use this to sort of minimize the within class um, variance of the data. Okay, so now we've got the means of the two classes. And we've got covariance across channels shared by the two classes. Now it's time to calculate the weights. Um, these weights will tell us how best to separate the two classes in our training data. But how do we actually do that? Well, there's actually not too many lines of code. It's a single line. But this single line of code, the big stuff happens. This is where we take the common covariance matrix and the difference between the two class means and use matrix left division to calculate the weights. So it's this guy here. Okay, so I'm not going to jump down the rabbit hole of what it means to do matrix left division today. It's a much bigger topic on linear, linear algebra, which requires its own week long workshop in its own right. But what I'm going to try and do is give you a comparison with another familiar analysis that uses matrix left division, and that's linear regression. So in linear regression, we want to try and predict our outcome variable, so that's y based on our predictive variables, x. So we might say that y is height, while x represents different variables such as age and sex, weighted by some unknown value, b. And when we take the values of x weighted by b, we should approximate y. We should approximate our outcome variable. And that's pretty much the goal of um, linear regression. It's given that we know x, given that we know y, how do, we ex um, sorry. How do we estimate the beta? Well, what we need to do is a little bit of a re rearrangement of the equation. So if we look at it like this, then we move the B onto this side and we do X matrix left division of Y. So that's the predictor matrix left division of the outcome variable is equal to the betas. And this will tell us exactly how to weight. If we get these betas, it'll tell us exactly how to weight x so that we can get a value in y. And this is exactly what we're going to use with the code. So we're going to use the covariance of the data and the mean difference between the categories to best predict how to separate the data. OK. So we use matrix left division to get the weights, which tells us how to best weight the data separate two classes. And if we plot, we can see how we should weight each of these channels. So we can then plot the output weights. So this is CFW. So it'll be a separate weight for each channel number. And then we can see what's happening in the weights. So a negative number means it's being flipped. The amplitude is being inverted. A large number means that their values are being multiplied, whereas a smaller number means they're being minimized. And Essentially, we will apply this to our data to try and separate categories out. Right? But it's important to note you shouldn't just go out and interpret these weights just because, you know, take for example, just because this one guy's got a huge weighting, we shouldn't assume it's really important. Nor does someone having a really small one, such as these guys here, I mean, it's not very important at all. It's just how the classifier works, and it takes the combination of these weights to figure out the data. 
I'm going to dive into this more in another video on confounds, but for now, just be happy that we know how to estimate our weights and also be happy to know that we don't interpret these weights too much. So now we've calculated the weights, we just need to do a little bit of scaling. So currently the weights are going to pull the data out to match mu1 or mu2, depending on the category, uh, whatever values they take. But we want to normalize this to put it between plus one and minus one to make it a little bit more uniform, a little bit more easy to understand. And all we need to do is just this little line, so this will shift it from trying to separate it into the values of mu1 and mu2 into the values of plus one and minus one. And then we just want to also calculate the bias from this uh, estimation, which we're going to take out later on when we apply it to the test data. Okay, so we're getting there. We're on the home stretch. The weights have been computed, and now we need to see how they generalize to the test data. Now, in the first instance, we'll compute the D value of the decision value, that's what's popping up here. This is a value which tells us how far a given trial sits in the decision boundary. Because of the weighting done on the last slide and our calculation of the bias, we can say here that any value greater than zero most probably belongs to class one, and any value which is below zero most probably belongs to class zero, no, class two, sorry. So to calculate the D value, we must multiply the data by the weights. So that's the first part, which is essentially sort of the uh, B times X in equal Y in our standard linear regression. And then we also just account for the bias. So this is the error, error term you'd have in Y equals BX plus F. And if we execute the code, we get an output like this. So we'll get a D value for every single trial. And this trial will tell us whether it's actually what we expect the outcome to be. So a negative value thinks, means that we think the data belongs to class two. The positive value, such as this guy here, means we belong to class one. If we want to make this a little bit more intuitive, rather than just looking at pluses and negatives, then we can look at the likelihood that the category is correct. And to do this, we can look at the likelihood or estimate the accuracy. So first, we would estimate the predicted label, which is this little guy. So if D value is greater than zero, we'll get a, a big vector of ones and zeros, which says one is, is true, but D value is greater than zero. So we'll turn that into a double and say that these are essentially doubles, um, double types in MATLAB rather than the logical, which would you get from this little bit here. So then this will give us a vector of what is category one. And then for this little guy, we want to look for D values less than zero, and this will give us a, another vector, which will tell us which ones are less than zero, at which point we double them again, and we times by two, so we get a value of two. And essentially, it just gives us a nice little vector of ones and twos, telling us what we expect the data to be. Okay, and then we can calculate the accuracy by saying how often the true labels, so that's C test, these are the labels we know in the true case, versus the predicted label. So if these guys match a lot, then we should get very high accuracy. If they don't seem to match at all, then we should get very low accuracy. And essentially, we can just sort of sum it up and then calculate the mean. How many times, on average, do we get the label correct? And this will give us accuracy. And if we run this, then we can see, yeah, we've managed to separate this true, real EEG data um, a little bit more so than you'd expect if we just randomly added some weights, which would give us about a 50% chance in a binary classifier. Now, this has all been done on one time frame. So we, we now know, that, I can't remember what time frame this was, but let's say it's about 200 milliseconds. We know that the classifier pr pr correctly predicts the uh, class at 200 milliseconds, with about 65% chance. But we want to also see how it generalizes across time. So what we can do is we can essentially loop through every time point. So we take our training data, we take our testing data, we take our training labels, we take our testing labels, and we cycle through each time point, which is the last dimension of X. And then we can use these functions, so train LDA and test LDA, these are the lines of code I've been running through you in these last few sections, and we can grab out the predicted labels and again, compute the accuracy by taking the mean and if we do this at every time point, we get this nice little time series. 
which is telling us with what chance we think we are correctly decoding stimulus content. Okay, so great, that was a very quick primer on how the code behind LDA works. We've seen that LDA aims to separate the two groups by maximizing the mean difference and minimizing the variance between the groups. And I took you the steps how uh, the function uh, in the TS Traders toolbox, uh, MVPA Lite, does this. Um, but yes, effectively by calculating the means, calculating the covariance, using the two of these together to calculate the weights on how you should upscale or downscale data, and then apply these weights to the test data and then predict the outcome. If you're interested in reading a little bit more, I would totally recommend the TS Traders paper, which he describes the MVPA Lite toolbox. Um, It'll give you an idea of how some functions work, the different types of classifier you could use, and also um, the different types of output you get from the classifier. And there's also this book by Bronson and colleagues on linear algebra. When I was talking about matrix left, left division, I really didn't dive into it. I uh, skirted around the issue. But if you want to learn more about the topic, it's a big topic and you would need to devote some time. But this book is a good place to start. So. Thanks for listening, and then I'll speak to you soon.